No other team sport relies more on every individual coming together as a team than rowing. If somebody wanted to join rowing, I would tell them just give it a shot and give it their all from the very beginning. Anybody can do it as long as you just set your mind to it. Rowing's not just a sport, rowing's kind of a way of life because it has this way of, of really taking over your life. It takes over when you go to bed, when you get up, what you eat, who your friends are. And I just love it. It's, it's me. I'm, I'm a water person. <laughs> Officials getting the crews lined up, ready to go at the start. Dump and Barry Townsend, lane three, New Western Australia that's got away well along with Victoria. South Australia, Queensland on 33 strokes to the minute, holding the lead behind their young stroke, Sarah Zillman. started in Italy when it was called Regatta, R-A-G-A-T-A, -A -A, and it was a bunch of people rowing and racing, racing boats. And that was somewhere in the 1400s. By the 1600s, it was formalized in England because there were ferrymen who were ferrying people across rivers, and if you've got two people, then you're gonna have a race. It got formalized, if you've ever heard of Handel's Water Music, there were races during that. And certainly by the 1700s, there were formal races. There's one race in England called Doggett's Coat and Badge, and that dates, I think, from the late 1700s. And that's still held every year in London, I think on the first weekend of August. So rowing goes back quite a long time, but like a lot of other sports, it comes from, in this case, transportation. on a Saturday morning in a thick haze and all over London there are the usual number of grandmother's funerals, thank you. Cambridge as the challengers come out first after Oxford have won the toss and surprisingly chosen the Middlesex side and here are the dark blues with their fantastically tiny cox Massey nephew of film star Raymond Massey riding a specially high seat in the boat. They're at the stake boats, the umpire calls, are you ready? And they're off on the boat race in the midst. Oxford and Cambridge had different colleges that rode against each other that was in the 1830s and that really developed Within the first 10 years or so, so in the 1840s, you had Oxford colleges rowing against each other and Cambridge colleges rowing against each other. And then about 20 years later, Harvard and Yale started doing that over here. So it was the first intercollegiate sport in both countries. rowing country in the Olympics is Great Britain, both for men and for women. Six golds last Olympics. The US is probably second or third. Lots and lots of different countries compete and, and have a chance of winning medals.
Rowing is a sport that was supposedly going to be one of the events at the first Olympics in 1896, which would obviously make it one of the original races. Unfortunately, because the wind conditions were so bad, it got cancelled. So it's a little bit of a moot point whether rowing was at the first Olympics or not, because it was scheduled, but it didn't happen. It's fairly recent that women's rowing has been allowed in at the Olympics. There's actually a book about this right now, but it's written by my former boss. Her name is Joanne Iverson, and she was one of the people who really pushed for women's rowing at the Olympics. She was a coach at Penn, just an avid rower um, out of the Philadelphia area, and um, she was one of the people who went to the governing body, FISA, and asked them, or, and worked and tried to get women's rowing allowed at the Olympics. The Olympic rowing was only for men up until 1976 when women were admitted for the first time in Montreal. Was rowing a spectator sport? Well, when rowing first came to the US and was, an, was a collegiate sport in, I think it was 1852 at Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire, the reason that it happened was because the local railroad wanted to sell land round Lake Winnipesaukee. So they publicized the race, they did all the publicity for it, because they wanted people to go out. They didn't really care much about the regatta, but it was an excuse to get all the people there. Since then, rowing is a very difficult sport to spectate because 2,000 meters, you really cannot see the start. So you can only see maybe the last 500 meters. Uh, best places to watch are at a bridge, then you can watch the, the crew row under you, which is kind of a fun thing. But it's, uh, it's very difficult to spectate. We, we have to tell the parents, yeah, you can come, you can watch, but you won't really get much idea of what's going on. Rowing has now both men's and women's events. It has heavyweight and it has also some lightweight events. Um, heavyweight men usually range from about, I'd say about 200 to 220 pounds. And height, you know, they try to get the tallest guys because the, the taller you are, uh, the bigger lever that you are in the boat. Um, but women, on the other hand, can be uh, there's a lightweight category which is 130 pounds and under, so it's not very much actually to be a lightweight woman uh, rower. And so there's um, lightweight women rowing and open weight women rowing, and then lightweight men is anyone under 160 pounds. So there's a lot of different categories so that um, people can be competitive and compete at a very high level. You can sometimes have the coxswain at the stern, which is what we're used to, the same as the eight. And the good thing about that is that as the coxswain is watching everything in terms of steering, they can also watch what everyone's doing rowing. Typically, um, in racing these days, the coxswain sits at the bow. It's called a bow loader. The coxswain then starts, you know, getting right in like this under the bow, and here's where the boat is. And the reason for that is it's faster because the coxswain's weight and, and profile is not being a drag in, in the water. So the different kinds of rowing, we've got sweep rowing, in which case everybody has one oar. And then we have sculling, in which everyone has two oars. If you've got two oars, you can have one person rowing, and that's a single. Or you can have two people rowing two oars, that's a double. You can also have two people doing sweep rowing, that is a pair, so you've got one person on this side, the other person on this side, and they'll balance each other out, you hope. And then you've got four people in sculling, which is a quad. Uh, you can also have four people in sweep rowing, which is a four with or without a coxswain. 
and then you've also got an eight, which is always uh, just sweet rowing. So, you know, lots of different configurations of boats. The technology hasn't changed very much over the course of rowing, and they kind of, I think, are peaking in terms of what they can do with a rowing shell. Um, the major change, obviously, was switching from wooden shells to uh, carbon fiber, and that didn't happen until the 70s. Um, and wooden, wooden rowing shells were raced up until about 2000 competitively, even at the high school level. Some people will still go out and purchase a wooden shell just because they think uh, they like the feeling of it. And a lot of rowing is like that. It's the same thing like buying a car. You know, you like the way a certain car handles. People who rode in wooden boats like the way they feel. Um, so in the 70s, they switched over to carbon fiber. And it happened first at the collegiate level. I think uh, Yale was probably one of the first people to have a carbon fiber boat. And now it's just the processes that they use um, add more stiffness and they also, um, it drops the weight down of the shell. You've gone from this incredibly heavy boat that probably was about mm, three or four feet wide and I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess about 40 feet long to something that's ridiculously 60 feet long and two feet wide. Crazy, crazy boat. Some other things that were different would be the oar lock would be just like a Y and it would go into the side of the boat, not an outrigger, just go into the side of the boat and then the oar would be placed in it and of course it could come out. And then the next thing that was developed was an outrigger so that if you have, if you've done biomechanics, if you've got an outrigger that's outside the boat then you can get proportionally more force on it rather than it just having a fulcrum here, it's now got a fulcrum here. Oars, the same thing, were also wooden before and they were pretty heavy um, and in, I want to say, also around the 70s and 80s, they started switching to the oars being made out of uh, carbon fiber as well. And they last a little bit longer. Um, but then the biggest change was in 1992. They switched from kind of a, a tulip or a spoon style oar blade to what's called a hatchet blade. And the hatchet blades is just like, a, it's just a bigger oar. And um, Dartmouth College was actually the first crew to have the hatchet style blade and that just record started dropping really quickly because of the just being able to load up a lot more on the face of the blade. And then the next thing was people started greasing their shorts and then they started having actually sliding seats. Well the, the sliding seat is actually a pretty new and you know not new but it, it's been around for about a hundred years but before that I guess they used to just grease up their shorts and slide back and forth on a wooden plank and um, that's, you know, usually the type of rowing that most people know about is, you know, people rowing on a pond in a little rowboat and it doesn't use their legs at all. But rowing that we know, that um, rowing as we coach it, it has a sliding seat, so it's a much more lower body intensive sport. So we work a lot on developing leg strength so that way we can really utilize that because your legs are your strongest muscles in your body. So your upper body, your arms just aren't as strong. Rowing is actually an interesting sport in which the training for it consists of both cardio and a lot of weightlifting. It's a really intense sport. It's cardio, it's, um, it's weight training, it, it feels like a leg press when you're in the boat, so um, it can be really intense. It's long and very hard and very grueling and very painful. You know, you're, you're going all out and it's not uncommon for people to feel nauseous or throw up or you know collapse in the boat at the end of a race. In rowing you're using mostly legs, you're also using core, you're certainly using back and you're using arms. It is maximal and it is quite hard work I would say because you're using pretty much every muscle in your body. Rowing's not just a sport. Rowing is not just a sport. Rowing is more of an expression of myself. It's, it's a lifestyle, really. It's addictive. It has this way of, of really taking over your life. Um, your teammates become your family, you know, and uh, yeah, it is. It's much more than a sport. To row or not to row, what kind of question is that? I mean, of course you're going to row. How can people not want to go on the water? 
please.